This is a presentation of the Lex Rex Institute, where we're committed to ensuring that the law remains our only king and that everyone is subject to it, even our leaders. I'm Alexander Haberbush, and I'm president of the Lex Rex Institute, and I'm also a practicing attorney in the area of constitutional law. And as always, nothing in this video constitutes legal advice. Although we are happy to give legal advice if you want to fill out the form on our website, lexrex.org, uh, we do offer free 30-minute consultations. Now, I know that I've already put out an Ask an Attorney video today, but I figured in honor of everyone's favorite holiday, uh, I, I ought to give an extra bonus one. So what is everyone's favorite holiday? Well, tax day, of course. And in honor of tax day, uh, I'll be answering the following question. What's the constitutionality of taxing unrealized capital gains? Okay, so I assume this question is being asked because of President Biden's new tax proposal. So currently, Biden has proposed uh, a tax proposal where we will tax capital gains even before somebody has sold that asset. So currently the way that capital gains tax works uh, is that if somebody's invested in something like a stock or uh, if they've bought uh, bonds, any kind of investment that is not cash, that is not liquid, that person is only taxed after that asset is sold because that's the point at which that asset becomes income. As long as you're holding on to something. Even if that thing is increasing in value, you don't have any new stuff. You don't have any new money. So it's not until you sell that asset when you actually realize a gain, and that's the point at which we typically tax things. So the question is, because now President Biden has proposed a plan whereby capital gains, you can't even really call it capital gains, but assets will be taxed even before somebody has sold them. So if you own an asset, say a stock, and that stock increases in value, you will be taxed on that stock even if you have not sold it, even though you still have the same number of shares you did when you bought it. Is that constitutional? Short answer, absolutely not. Uh, but let me explain to you why that's the case. Okay, so when looking at issues of taxation, there are going to be three sections of the Constitution that are significant for us. And those are going to be, let me pull them up real quick. So the first section we're going to look at is Article 1, Section 8. As we remember, Article 1 is about the powers of Congress, the powers of the uh, legislative branch of government. And Section 8 is specifically it lists those powers that Congress has. So reading here, it says, Congress shall have the power to lay and collect taxes. There we go. Congress has the power to tax. Now, let's turn to Article 1, Section 9. Uh, this section is limitations on the powers of Congress. So the power to tax is subject to certain limits. Let's look at what those limits are. So here we have it. No capitation or other direct tax shall be laid unless in proportion to the census of enumeration herein before directed to be taken. What does that mean? It's kind of a complicated sentence, but what that's saying is that if Congress wants to have a direct tax, what's well, a direct tax? Well, it's a tax on specific people uh, where the person is actually paying the tax directly because you can have other taxes. You could have uh, tariffs, duties, where things are taxed when they were imported to the United States. You could have taxes upon states. That's a possibility. Direct taxes are taxes upon the people themselves. So you can only have a direct tax. Congress can only have a direct tax if it's, if it's laid in proportion to the census of enumeration here and before directed to be taken. What does that mean? Well, that just means that it has to be proportional to the habitation of each state. In other words, if, say, Maine has 100 people, and New Hampshire has 50 people, that's the total population of each state, well, then Maine can only pay twice as much as New Hampshire is paying. Each person has to pay the same amount under what the Constitution says in Article 1, Section 9. So that's sort of a pretty strict limitation on the power to tax, uh, to lay direct taxes at least. Well, would a capital gains tax be direct, or would a, an increase in the value of one's assets be a direct tax? Yeah, it would, because that tax is directly affecting an individual person. So it's certainly not going to be in proportion to the census, because different people have different amounts of assets, different people have different amounts of money. But as we know, the government already taxes richer people more than poorer people. That's what we call the graduated income tax. So why is that allowed? Well, for me to show why that's allowed, let me pull up uh, the next thing here, next section of the Constitution we're looking at which is going to be the 16th Amendment. And here we have 
And this, what Sixth Amendment does is it basically creates an exception to that Article One, Section 9 rule that I just read about taxes being proportioned to the census. And what Sixth Amendment says is that the Congress shall have the power to lay and collect taxes on incomes from whatever source derived without apportionment among the several states and without regard to any census or enumeration. Okay, so now we've got an exception to that requirement of, of enumeration in proportion to the census. Now Congress can pass laws that enact taxes on incomes only. So they are allowed to tax income. Well, the question then becomes at that point, what exactly is an income? Well, Commissioner v. Glenshaw Glass, a 1955 case, defined the word income to mean an undeniable ascension to wealth, clearly realized and over which the taxpayer has complete dominion. Okay, well, it, it's certainly that clearly realized portion of that definition is going to be awfully difficult to show when it comes to unrealized capital gains. Because it says explicitly that any income has to be something that is realized. Also, it has to be undeniable significantly, according to that definition. And it has to be something over which a taxpayer has complete dominion. Well, is that true? In many cases, it's not true of assets that one realizes gain on because those are stocks. Those are things over which they don't have complete control. They're, a company that uh, has organized and has issued that stock is going to have control over some of it. So really it doesn't mean any of those, any parts of that test. Uh, there's not really a real plausible argument there, I don't think. But looking again even perhaps more directly on point is going to be the case of Eisner v. McCumber, which is a 1920 case. What that case says, uh, let me pull up something for you guys to look at again. So what this case looked at was a dividend that had been issued by a company, and the IRS was trying to tax that dividend. And what the court had to say was that, uh, if we look right here, mere growth or increment of value in a capital investment is not income. Income is essentially a gain or profit in itself of exchangeable value proceeding from capital, severed from it, and derived or received by the taxpayer for his separate use, benefit, and disposal. And it goes on. A stock dividend evincing merely a transfer of accumulated surplus to the capital account of the corporation takes nothing from the property of the corporation and adds nothing to that of the shareholder. In other words, this dividend issued could not be income under the, what the meaning of the 16th Amendment because it did not add any, it didn't take anything from anyone or give anything to anybody else. Nobody derived any income from it because they didn't get anything new out of it. And that's going to be true with somebody who has not sold one of their investments as well. Because say you buy a stock and you hold on to that stock, even if it increases in value, you still have the same thing that you had before. You don't get something new, you do not get income until you have sold that stock. So really what this proposal from President Biden amounts to is what we call a wealth tax. And wealth taxes are not permitted under the Constitution. Now, some people will argue that wealth taxes actually are permitted under the Constitution. They like to cite a 1900 case. This is actually a pre-16th Amendment case, because remember, 16th Amendment was implemented in 1913. So this is pre-16th Amendment, and this is a case called Noel v. Moore. Uh, what this case accepted was the legitimacy of an inheritance tax. So a tax that is levied when one person dies and then bequeaths or, or gives his money to his heirs or assigns. And this was upheld, uh, but Significantly, what we need to look at here, and what I think proponents of Biden's tax proposal are ignoring, is that inheritance tax actually does transfer wealth from one person to another. In effect, what it does is it taxes the income of the person who receives the money. This is no different from taxing realized capital gains on stock, but it says nothing about taxing unrealized gains. A person's wealth is entirely theoretical until their assets have been made liquid. And that's the point at which they derive income, so that's the point at which we levy taxes. Now, another case to keep in mind when uh, looking at this issue is going to be Pollock v. Farmers Loan and Trust, which is an 1895 case. Again, that's going to be a pre-16th Amendment case. And in that case, the Supreme Court held that a tax is direct if it's upon the holders in respect to their estates, whether real or personal, or of the income yielded by such estates and the payment of which cannot be avoided. So that's looking at the issue under Article 1, Section 9 of what taxes constitute direct taxes. So what makes a tax direct? Well, again, so let me repeat that language from the case. It's upon shareholders in respect to their estates whether real or personal, 
or of the income yielded by such estates and the payment of which cannot be avoided. In other words, a tax is direct if it's upon stuff that people own. So an estate is going to be your property. It's not just your land estate, but it's also your personal property as well, personality. So lands and chattels would be sort of the historic legal way of saying that. Uh, and that is what constitutes a direct tax, is when the tax is upon those sorts of things rather than upon public monies or upon transactions or any other such thing. So those are going to be things that are under the purview of that protection in Article 1, Section 9. That's worth keeping in mind. That's been reaffirmed as recently as 2012 uh, in NFIB v. Sibelius. So again, to answer the question here, no, absolutely not. I do not think that Biden's tax plan is constitutional. If it does end up getting approved by Congress, which I think doubtful because Congress has staffers and these staff and many lawyers work for members of Congress, at least I hope lawyers work for members of Congress. So although stuff does get off the ground that's very clearly unconstitutional. But if this does end up getting passed, you can rest assured that the Lex Rex Institute will be bringing legal action to ensure that this tax plan is held unconstitutional and removed. So if you know somebody who would be subject to these new taxes, please get them in contact with us because we would love to represent them. Now, I think sort of the elephant in the room here is the, the Biden administration keeps trying to sell the people this tax plan by saying that it only affects the ultra wealthy because they're not going to be taxing all capital increase here. They're going to be taxing only those who make are over a certain wealth threshold. And it's, you know, hundreds, hundred million dollars or something like that, some very high amount. Okay, you know, that's fine. That's all well and good. I understand the intention there. But since when are wealthy Americans not allowed constitutional rights. And this is explicitly referenced in the Constitution, Article 1, Section 9. You have a very, very clear right that any tax levied against you is once in proportion to the census unless it falls in that 16th Amendment exception. So, you know, I think it's absurd to say that wealthy Americans don't have rights. Obviously, they have legal protections under our Constitution. I think that's Frankly, that's a, an appalling and somewhat abhorrent argument that people shouldn't have rights merely because they are wealthy. So I, I do not agree with that at all. I don't think the court would agree with that. Uh, but that's, you know, frankly, not really an argument. So I, I think that sort of answers the question about the constitutionality of Biden's proposed tax plan. Uh, again, happy tax day. I hope everybody's managed to file their tax returns. I think you have till Monday to do it, though. So, you know, get those in on Monday if you haven't done it yet. But that covers what, well, actually, one, one last point of note about the 16th Amendment. There is some question out, so obviously 16th Amendment is kind of a huge modification of the tax scheme that was put in place in the original Constitution. And it's not one that, I don't think I have to make any kind of apology about this. It's not a change that I'm particularly fond of, and I don't think it's a change that's consistent with our constitutional order. And I do believe there actually are some existing constitutional challenges to the 16th Amendment. Some of the ones that have been made in the past and could probably stand to be revisited, although they have been rejected in the past, are that it uh, violates rights against self-incrimination. You know, that's a, really a possible avenue to go after that. Uh, and more significantly, there is some question about whether the 16th Amendment was ever actually properly ratified, since some of the states ratified a different wording of the amendment that actually imposed a, a cap on the maximum possible income tax. I believe it was 10%. So if that's something you're interested in hearing about and want to know more about 16th Amendment, you can ask about that in a future video, but I'm not going to touch on it in too much depth here, just to mention that that's a... Uh, of questionable legality to begin with, although they don't seem to mind collecting on it. So everybody have a good time paying your taxes. Uh, <laughs> and remember, if you do get a tax refund at the end of the day, that's not you getting a, pay, a paycheck from the government. That's money that you loaned to the government for the past year and for which they have not paid you any interest. So really much rather write a check to the government, owe them something than have them pay you money because that just means they borrowed your money even without legal authority to do it. They're admitting they had no legal authority to do that. So if you do get a refund, try not to celebrate too much. Uh, but this has been a presentation of the Lex Rex Institute. Once again, I'm Alexander Haberbush, president of the Lex Rex Institute and a constitutional attorney. Uh, and if you do feel so moved, please make a donation on our website. It's not too late for you to get those tax deductions for the 2022 tax year. So you can do that on our website. We are tax deductible. Uh, that's all. This has been a presentation of the Lex Rex Institute.